Today's webinar is about youth employment, exploring barriers and opportunities. I just want to let everyone know that they're able to ask questions throughout. We will be curating your questions and there will be time towards the end of the conversation to ask those questions of our panelists. You'll see the questions box in your control panel. Feel free to ask a question at any time. You'll also find under the handouts a copy of the slides that you're seeing on screen right now. I want to share with you who is going to be joining us on today's webinar. We have Tamara from Civic Action, Lucas from Red Reach, Asuvawe from Toronto Youth Cabinet, and Gladys from First Work. And I'm going to give each person an opportunity to introduce themselves and their connection to this issue. And folks have prepared a few slides to help guide that part of the conversation. So we're going to start with Tamara. Hi, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Um, I am Tamara. I uh, work here at Civic Action. Uh, a few years ago, we began our work on youth unemployment. And I, and I will just describe a little bit of who we are and how we got into that piece of work. So Civic Action is an incubator that works across all sectors to try to make greater progress on the social and economic challenges that the greater Toronto Hamilton area faces. And a few years ago, we were seeing historically high youth unemployment rates. But more importantly, we continued to see a gap between the average youth unemployment rate and much higher unemployment rates among Indigenous youth, racialized youth, newcomer youth, youth who, who are living in poverty, youth who've lived in care or living in care. And so our work really was focused on closing that gap. How? we set out to work more deeply with the private sector, with employers who may have been engaged in some of the work that supported greater opportunities for youth, but frankly had a much greater role to play. And over the years, we've done a few things. First, we've developed a strategy that identified what things employers and, and those in the private sector could do to help build the skills that youth needed for the jobs market, helped establish new relationships, mentoring relationships, helped to share more information about the jobs market, and most importantly, helped to reduce the barriers that youth were encountering to get that first foot in the door. Um, that's a little bit about um, what our work set out to do. Um, what you see on the screen now is our most recent piece of work, which tackles that last item around reducing the barriers in the workplace. We know that youth encounter a number of barriers through the hiring and HR practices. And over the last two years, we have tried to make it a lot easier for employers to one, understand what those barriers may be, and most importantly, what best practices there are to overcome them. These are ones that make sense for the employers and that frankly help youth, particularly vulnerable youth, um, have a fair shot at the job. What you see here is a dashboard of a tool that we uh, developed. It's free, it's easy for employers to use, it generates customized recommendations for each and every workplace depending on their situation. So we like to think it's very relevant. Employers can enter their coordinates. So they plug in information about their current hiring practice, about how they source and recruit for entry level jobs, about the work that they do on onboarding, and based on those answers, they'll receive three recommendations tailored to them that we believe will have a, a great impact on, uh, on opening up opportunities that may otherwise not be available. We don't sort of leave employers hanging. And with the recommendations, we provide very specific case studies, templates, worksheets that employers can replicate in their own organization and learn from peers in uh, their industry. So really it's about employers better accessing youth who are willing and ready to work um, in their workplaces and figuring out how best to do that. And I want to highlight just one recommendation because I think it's especially relevant to, uh, to this audience uh, this morning. One of our recommendations is to address a challenge that employers consistently raised. 
And that is that one of the hardest things they feel um, in hiring for entry level positions is actually sourcing and recruiting candidates. This is at the same time that we know there are hundreds of thousands of youth across Ontario who aren't in education, employment and training. So what's the issue? We need better um, points of connection and that's where you who are providing support to youth directly play a critical role. We've helped employers understand how to better work with community partners to make sure they're leveraging the expertise, the trust that you hold and uh, the number of relationships that, that you may have with young people who are well suited for their job. Thank you. Thank you. I think next we're going to um, have Lucas introduce himself. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much. All right, so uh, let's hop right into it. So let's talk about um, first off who I am. So my name is Lucas. Um, I'm 17 years old and I co founded a company called Red Reach. Um, so I'm actually here in our office right now. Um, and because of uh, the work that my team and I did with Red Reach, I was able to um, be awarded the Ontario Junior Citizen Award. Um, would you mind switching to the next slide? Awesome. So let's talk about what Red Reach is. So Red Reach is an online website that connects local Hamilton youth um, to local jobs for the age level and skill set. So they can search for jobs depending on their age category. So if they're above 15 years of age, if they're under 18 years of age, or if they're over 18 years of age. They can also look for jobs based on high school jobs, college jobs, university jobs, co-ops, you name it, internships. Um, just right now, we, we, we got done finishing our kind of our summer job rush. So we had a whole lot of uh, summer job opportunities on the site. And we started in Hamilton. So we have a lot of Hamilton service providers using us, connecting the youth, um, a lot of Hamilton schools using, uh, using us, and now we're spreading outwards. And now we're beginning to target other channels that we can also help youth with. And one of these huge channels is, is that we're actually reaching out to, to, to the private sector too. So um, our first pilot, we call it because it's not really um, a full up plan yet. So we're still testing out this idea, but we partnered with the Beaverdale, so that tasty kind of dessert, and we made their HR portal for them. And so with this HR portal, they can now hire youth directly um, through our technology. And thanks to this HR portal, they can, um, they can find youth in the local area, connect youth to their beaver tails position and so on. And we're hoping to do this with other franchises too, if it works out to be a success. And one, one thing we also did about two months ago um, for youth in the Ontario area, um, our team went down to the Ontario Legislative Assembly. We were invited by um, an MPP from Ms. Saga and we helped pass a motion uh, to help decrease youth and employment rate within Ontario. So this is passed by the PC government. And what this motion will do if turned into a bill within over the next few months is that every riding in Ontario will then receive a certain budget per year to decrease their youth unemployment rate. And we're not sure about the logistics just yet. We're still in the midst of planning it out, but this is early, early, early stage. So it's probably going to kick in within the next year or year and a half now. And um, yeah, that's all you need to know about me. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to turn it over to Sibue. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Osivoe Itselma, as I've been introduced, and I work with the Toronto Youth Cabinet in the capacity of the Equity and Employment Lead for the 2018-2019 year. Um, and the work we do at the Toronto Youth Cabinet is we are a nonpartisan youth-led advocacy group uh, the official advocacy group, I would say, for the City of Toronto. And what we do at the City of Toronto is we help advocate for change in everything and anything that relates to youth. Um, now, more specifically for me, as the leader of the Equity and Employment Working Group, we look to, um, first of all, improve the unemployment rate amongst youth. Um, Kathy, if you could please help me go to the next slide. Um, we have some interesting numbers. So, according to Stats Canada, as you can see, uh, the unemployment rate for youth aged 15 to 24 in Ontario is 11.4%. Um, now we're falling behind Quebec, PEI, Manitoba, and BC, and I believe that and I believe the entire city also believes that we can do better and we can help um, improve the rates of um, unemployment in Toronto for youth. And hopefully, in a few years, we can make sure that number goes to zero percent. Now at the TYC this year. We published a report. Uh, if you could just help me go to the next slide as well, Katie. The report is called The Young Workers Left Out, 
the integration of Toronto youth and the city's labor market. And in this report, we went and took out primary research. That is, we spoke to stakeholders, youth, uh, non-governmental organizations, employers, and everyone who has a stake, we believed, in um, to youth in Toronto, right? And what we realized from this report was that there were a few reoccurring themes that youth had um, in the labor market in terms of precarious work, in terms of you know contract jobs, in terms of stigmatization of them just being youth. And you know there were just a lot of barriers that we saw to youth employment. And we decided that this report was going to be a stepping stone to the work that we will continue to do in subsequent years for the TYC. Um, currently, if you could go to the next slide, um, Kathy, uh, as the leader of this year, we are working on a report called the Social Returns and Investment Report. And this report is basically aimed at measuring the social value derived from youth programs and youth um, agencies in the city of Toronto. Uh, and now, as we, a lot of people know, there's several opportunities for youth to get jobs in Toronto. There's a lot of programs and there's a lot of organizations that focus on helping youth get jobs. And unfortunately, these programs often do not reach uh, as wide as target markets as they could possibly can. And because of these barriers that I spoke about earlier, we've realized that there's a sort of disconnect between the people they're intent to reach and the people that are supposed to be reached. And we intend to use this report as more of a metric scale to see what the social value in terms of youth employment and youth prosperity is and help us get a better understanding of how we can you know, bridge the gap and improve the rates of unemployment. Um, also, we are trying to do a data analysis report um, for more concrete evidence that draws from a multitude of job postings around Toronto. We were looking for the recurring names, the recurring skills, the recurring type of um, requirements, so to speak, that youth will need entering the labor force. And we're trying to use this as more of a uh, data collection um, project to see how we can streamline that access to employment for youth and help them understand how better to navigate the youth um, or the general labor market for them. Um, so that's who I am and that's what we're working on at the TYC so far. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Gladys, do you want to introduce yourself and speak a little bit about, about your work and, and your connection to these issues? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Gladys O'Kine. I am the executive director of First Work. And First Work is an umbrella organization for youth employment service providers across the province of Ontario. The organization itself is 30 years old now. And in 30 years, we have yet to solve the problem of youth unemployment. Uh, what we have been able to do is better coordinate services, better align services, and integrate uh, the demands and needs of employers in growing industries and sectors, and bring those bring those elements into better alignment so that we can maximize the use of our, our resources and efforts. Um, one of the key things that we are working on right now is uh, an initiative that we are calling the Council for Youth Prosperity. And that council is an interdisciplinary body made up of individuals like yourselves, uh, funders, community partners, uh, government funders, private sector, you know, a real good cross section of people who uh, work with young people, uh, connect them to opportunities and support their success. And we're really challenging and asking the questions of how could we better coordinate our services? How can we better support employers to navigate their way through the variety of opportunities that are available? What standards do we have in place to support youth employment? Uh, because uh, it's questionable as to as to how uh, some employers, some companies are able to access resources and funds uh, based on the experiences and uh, incidents that occur with young people in some workplaces. Um, and they're also exploring the question of how we can better support uh, those young people who, who experience trauma, uh, live with mental health and intellectual and or physical disability. Uh, ability challenges or, or exceptionalities. And so how can we make the system as a whole work better? And so the aim of First Work and the Council Initiative is really to explore uh, how can we build a robust 
workforce development system for young people, not just in Ontario, uh, but across the country. So really excited to uh, participate and moderate this conversation today with these panelists, but also in looking at some of the questions that came for, forward uh, with those of you who are who are actively doing this work every day um, and, uh, and guiding young people along this really critical time in, in their lives. So that is us, and uh, if anyone is interested, you can take a look at our website, which is firstwork.org. Great, thank you so much, Gladys. I'm gonna invite all of the panelists to join, um, to come back on camera, and uh, and get and then Gladys, I'll let you take it away to, to moderate the conversation, thank you. Yeah, sure, thanks so much, Katie. So welcome back, everyone. It's nice to see everybody there. Uh, so the first question, I'm actually gonna draw on one of the questions that came in from a participant and throw that out to kick us off. Um, and that is, you all have different approaches that you've taken. You've highlighted them a little bit in your introductions around where you're focused um, and the nature of the initiatives that you're moving forward. So the first question I wanted to throw out is, in your opinion, what is the best way to tailor a local approach to address youth unemployment? Uh, so within your, within your world, within your sphere, within your ability to influence, in your, in your impression and your opinion, based on your experience, what do you think is the best way to approach uh, local solutions to youth unemployment? So maybe I will start off with Lucas, since uh, you have a pretty practical example right there in Hamilton where you live. Awesome. Yeah, so um, as far as the biggest success that we've had, as far as the, the easiest and most feasible local approach, is um, we originally reached out to the school board, and the, 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 there's two main school boards in Hamilton. One's the Hamilton one where it's district school board, and the other one's the Hamilton one with Catholic district school board. And mm -hmm. those school boards comprise of mainly 95% of the youth ages 15 to 19 within Hamilton. So by reaching to these school boards, we were able to connect with all of the guidance counselors these school boards. And these guidance counselors, essentially their role is to help youth with problems like this. And they put up promotional materials for absolutely, um, for absolutely whatever cause it may be, as long as it's a good opportunity for the students. So a big thing that helped us out is we sent a simple PDF promotional material to these guidance counselors, and then they started getting the word out to the students. Because a big issue is not, is not is now that isn't, it's not that um, there isn't this program out there. It's that youth don't necessarily know about that program. So it's a factor of knowledge about that program that, that, that is the biggest problem or the biggest hurdle that we need to get kind of across to you is that we, we built it. But then, um, and so, so we built our platform. And then the issue is, is that we had an issue of uh, reaching to youth is that our issue wasn't necessarily powering the platform, but getting youth onto the platform, getting the knowledge out, getting the word out. So as far as my recommendation to um, the biggest kind of easiest way or most feasible way to start out within the community, say for example, Hamilton or wherever you're looking to start up in for your youth project or youth, youth initiative is the school board. So school faculties, university, college, or high school. Okay, thank you so much. Tamara, can I throw it to you? Oh, we can't hear you. Let's double check that. Hello. Thanks. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and I'll just build on Lucas's point. I, I think the example of partnering with school boards is, um, is great. Certainly one of the key factors to success would be, I think, to go where youth are congregating, are engaging, are interacting. So whether that's in physical places or whether that's online, but I think what we um, are dealing with is a is a huge problem and we need solutions that are scalable which means in order to go from the hundreds perhaps even thousands of youth that we can touch through our existing models to the hundreds of thousands yeah. we need to ensure that we are um, really uh, engaging where youth are number one number two a key part of this is the employer experience and if we want to open up hundreds of thousands of jobs, then it's got to make sense for employers. So it really needs to address their hiring needs. It needs to make sure, uh, we need to make sure that we are working closely with the uh, employer community to understand the skills that they're looking for, the experiences that may they may be looking for, and frankly, helping them understand what they may put in place to keep youth who may be very well suited for their jobs out. And that's why we sort of developed tools that, frankly, are intended very much so to make it easier to reach a group of youth that we know are um, 
great candidates for uh, the work that may be available, but are often overlooked. Okay, thank you so much. So you're hitting it from both sides. You know, Lucy, Lucas's example of working directly with school boards, connecting with youth, youth in your community, uh, and your example of connecting directly with employers. So you better understand what their needs are, and making sure that is also addressed. So, Osibi, what about what about you from your from your perspective, your experience on the youth cabinet, and even just your experience as a young person as a whole? Any any thoughts around what do you think is the best way, uh, best local approach? Right, right. Um, I would have to really agree with Lucas because I feel like before I say what the best approach is, I would like to emphasize that what we realized was a major problem was the disconnect between the people and the opportunities. And we realized that there's no shortage on, on either end. There's willing youth, there's capable youth, there's skilled youth, there's driven youth, and there's also opportunities for these youth to apply their skills and empower themselves and, you know, develop the things they've always wanted to develop. Um, and I believe that the best means, as um, my experience could speak for, is taking the opportunities to the youth. I think by necessarily going out there and finding the people who you know require these opportunities that might not be able to access them because of transportation, because of technology, because of their postal code, or, or a variety of factors, I believe that if we are able to promote organizations and agencies that go out and make sure or make it their their mandate to bring the youth to the jobs and to the opportunities um, i think that's the best um, way to go locally because if we are truly aiming to solve the issue of unemployment and help people who have the best skills achieve their goals we need to necessarily take them to where they should be we can't necessary we can't put the information out there and hope that they can get to it we can do our best and say hey we've created a chance and we've posted it out there mm -hmm. on the internet or this and that we need to make sure there is fusion and see it through past the initial stage see it through past development see what happens in five years and follow through and make sure there's continuity in these um programs mm -hmm. that, that's awesome so just building on what you've all shared, I want to take us a little bit further into this this journey of job search and then securing a placement and then you know being supported with how you navigate your way through different opportunities. You mentioned um, just picking up on your comment of civil way, talking about just the variety of youth that we're talking about: skilled, experienced, uh, talented. You know, there's we use youth as a very general term uh, to describe a lot of people at various stages in their life. Um, I think the common denominator is they are they are somewhere along the continuum of transitioning from being a child to an adult and lots of things happen uh, through that through that phase in life. And so how would you all prompt a new way of thinking about youth? And so one of the questions that came through from participants was how to prompt a new way of thinking about meet youth, not employed in an education or training uh, to succeed longer term, uh, which begs the question of if we keep using this term youth in such a general fashion to kind of paint everyone with the same brush, how do you prompt a new way of thinking to promote opportunities, to bring opportunities to them um, and make them available? So maybe we'll work backwards. A civil way will start off with you and work backwards. Right, right. First of all, that is a great question um, because thinking about it from that perspective helps us narrow down the target audience. Um, and just to clarify, at the TYC, we consider youth uh, between the ages of 15 and 24. And these are the same metrics that the Statistics Canada also uses to measure unemployment and growth and development and other key metrics. Um, but I think um, in terms of thinking about it in a new way to essentially capture middle school students, capture high school students, capture uh, people going um, into forms of tertiary education, I think we should more or less narrow down into subsets of ages. So if we're talking about youth to a potential stakeholder, we need to make sure they know that there's people in high school who go to school eight hours a day and cannot be out past 10 p.m. at night and have a narrow space between, for example, four and seven to go and do extracurriculars, which include getting job experience that will be needed for them in the future. Um, I think if we break it down and see how we can focus on helping or developing policy that affects high school kids, 
um, that affects kids that are not in school or kids that do not have the opportunity to be part of any employment agency or program and say, okay, this is a subset of youth that we need to develop on this way. There's no one linear path of growing or improving the unemployment rate. This is a dynamic set of people we're working with in Toronto. We have immigrant population, newcomer youth, which is a very, very important part of the um, um, whole city. And I feel like if we focus on each sector and we have different people who have good intentions, seeing how they can really develop people ages 15 to 17, ages 18 to 19, ages 20 to 22, and make sure that there's a close relationship between these people. I think that's the way to go. Anybody else want to jump in on that? I'll just throw it out to the rest of the panel. For sure, I can jump in. Sure. Um, so for sure. So you mentioned uh, the youth, uh, um, the non-educated or um, currently in training rate. Um, so we hear, uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a universal term, may not be, but the, the, the youth need rate. So NEET rate. Um, so in Hamilton, um, Red Reach partnered up with um, Youth Can. So they're a new organization, they're privately funded, and they're solely addressing just that, the youth meet rate in Hamilton. So they're, they're not addressing general youth unemployment, they're not addressing, addressing university student unemployment, they're addressing the youth meet rate unemployment. So, and we have, and, and, and they haven't really released a solution just yet to see if, if, um, if what, what they're doing works and what, what they're doing has lowered the employment rate, but what they are doing is they're building up to that. And from them building up to that, so when, when they do release a solution, then we will be able to, to tell if narrowing down on a certain demographic of youth unemployment, so the youth meet rate, the, um, that unemployment rate, um, and that demographic will work or not. And in theory, we think it will, and we hope it will. Um, so by doing th certain things like that, narrowing down onto certain demographics um, will work, we hope. We hope, we hope. Any last thoughts, uh, Tamara, on that one? Yeah, I, I'll just add um, three, I think. So how do we get um, people thinking differently about the need population? I think the first is helping to translate their experiences into in-demand skills. So employers are looking for a growth mindset, an ability to collaborate, an ability to work well with the team. Youth have those experiences either from their volunteer work, from their responsibilities at home. Translating that um, so that it's clear how, how these skills can be applied in the workplace is number one. Number two is, I think, helping to facilitate really phenomenal experiences in the workplace. I think we need um, more employers to see that, that this works, that these are indeed youth who are ready for those jobs. And so those first few experiences that an employer may have with a population that they haven't yet really recruited uh, from are really critical. And that's where I think really working with the community partners that understand their youth population, understand the needs of the employers and making sure those matches are bang on is really important. And then the third piece I'd say is working with champions. Champions in the community, champions in the workplaces to say, yes, this works. And so I'll give the example of a program that we helped um, bring here to Canada that had already been underway in the US called NPower. NPower is an IT skills focused training program for youth, um, who many who, of whom are not in um, post-secondary, may or may not have completed even a secondary, but who might be well suited for uh, roles in, in IT. And through a very intensive uh, course sort of work over 15 weeks and a paid internship paid for by the employer, youth have the experience of understanding if not if it isn't or isn't a good fit, have the workplace experience that may then lead to a full-time uh, job in that workplace or, or elsewhere. And I think they've done a really good job of understanding both sides. They also in their model have a social worker that can support a young person through that transition because they may have needs that an employer is not gonna be able to help them with, whether it's housing, whether it's mental health support that they need to access. And having that available while you're trying something new uh, and somewhat maybe scary, uh, I think is really important. So making sure that we have the champions um, letting others know about things that work well is really important. 
Well, I think you guys all shared some really key takeaways, you know, um, just in terms of how to prompt a new way of thinking. Uh, this sector seems to be, we're always speaking from a deficit perspective, what we're missing, what we don't have, what needs to be fixed. It justifies the work that we do. It helps people understand why they need to contribute, why we need to allocate dollars. Uh, but when you're trying to get uh, you know, young people to think differently about themselves, but also those that we wish to make sure that they can provide opportunities to think differently about giving them to them. You can't always speak from a deficit perspective about what's wrong with them and what the problem is, right? And so I think you guys shared some really key ways to, to start thinking about even the language that we use and how we showcase opportunities, learning from what makes sense. Uh, the, like the example uh, Lucas provided around working with a new organization that has positioned itself to specifically understand this population uh, and might what might work for them. You know, the examples that you shared, way around um, the variety of young people that we're taking into consideration. It's not a one size fits all. Uh, and so what there's nothing wrong with it. Look, exploring more tailored approaches that may make sense uh, because at least you're moving the needle in some kind of way and you can keep track of that. And I think you shared a few nuggets with us, you know, uh, Tamara, in terms of those three areas to, to share what's awesome, make sure that they have an awesome experience uh, making because word of mouth goes a long way. And I'm sure we can all attest to that when it comes to all people, but especially young people, you have a good experience. You connect with an individual that's really supportive. You're going to share you're going to share that with other people um, and that will help promote as well um, so we're thinking differently we have a new approach to moving young people forward and so let's talk a little bit more about the kinds of experiences that we could potentially create um, i think those who are who have joined us and are participating today represent working with young people in a wide variety of ways um, they may or may not be working in the in the youth employment space, uh, but certainly in the youth engagement space um, and youth development space. And so maybe you all can share with us a little bit, and Tamara, maybe I'll start off with you. What is a meaningful experience for a work, a meaningful work experience for a young person? Uh, because I'm, I'm, I think we can all agree that we're not just about take, talking about taking someone and putting them in any kind of job, just to be able to say that they're working. Uh, so experience really, really does impact the quality and the nature of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so what is a meaningful work experience uh, for a young person? So I'll throw it to Tamara and then uh, the others can jump in uh, if you have any. Uh, Thank you. And I like to do things in three. So I have sort of three points to answer that okay. question. But before I dive into that, I did just want to say that when we set out to do this work, we actually talked to more than 200 youth. So here's what we heard. Number one is work that they can contribute their skills and passion to. Number two is where they can develop and learn new things and build some new relationships. And then the third is really important. Um, meaningful work means earning a decent income, which may mean a certain number of hours, um, a proximity to their uh, home to be able to really uh, fully commit to the work. But I think the income piece is really important. And that's often something that youth asked about. We actually would like to know more about the compensation, whether that's the wage or other benefits that employers are willing to offer us when they uh, consider whether or not to apply. So providing more information about that is helpful. Okay, okay, great. Guys, uh, any thoughts? What is a meaningful work experience uh, for a mm -hmm. young person? For sure. Um, so for a meaningful work experience for youth, it really come, it, it's, it's really a matter of opinion. So what I may consider as a meaningful work experience may, may be way different from what another youth considers and from what another youth considers. So it's mainly the motivation or the objective or what mainly they're trying to get out of it or what the purpose is for working there. Um, sometimes it's just financially, sometimes they need to make X amount of dollars for the summer to do X thing. And that's cool. If they do that, that's awesome. And that's all they need to do. That's fantastic. Sometimes they need to save for university, so they need uh, tuition benefits or whatever it may be. So there's different work experiences. Others uh, maybe they, they want to get real experience to put it um, to put into their future, like trades experience or experience uh, for their employer to write a reference for them. So there's different sorts of things. Um, so it's difficult to put a kind of big blanket over all of them. So what we help help to do, firstly with 
with Red Reach and with our website is that we help to connect these youth to the experiences that they want. So if they want to just make X amount of dollars, awesome. They can connect to a job and then they can see which one has the highest wage. But if they want to explore things like benefits or things like they want to get experience, they can then search through, through the category, search through, through the industry of that job for high school, college, and university. Um, there's also certain things to say, for example, McDonald's. Um, a youth there could just work at McDonald's to get um, X amount of dollars, and that's awesome. But McDonald's also offers a lot of benefits, tuition benefits too, which is fantastic for youth that a lot of youth don't know about. So we're also help helping connect youth to these opportunities and knowledge too. So if they want to get um, tuition benefits or save for tuition, um, McDonald's and other organizations are the way to go. So as far as the, the, the meaningful work work experience, it really boils down to what that youth wants to get out of that job. Excellent, excellent. Also, boy, any thoughts? Right, definitely. I'd have to agree 100% with Lucas and Tamari on this. I think uh, what a meaningful work is, is very subjective to the employee or the worker. And I think um, it's just very important to look at it from the employee perspective and not from the person who is giving the person the job. Uh, I believe that meaningful work is what makes you want to wake up in the morning, afternoon or night and, you know, not have to think about how dreadful your next eight hours are going to be or four hours or two hours. Um, and I think meaningful work is about what makes you happy, what makes you achieve your inner peace and what makes you a prosperous youth person or you know human in general okay so let's throw a wrench in so we know that there needs to be again it's not a one-size-fits-all there needs to be um acknowledgement that various elements motivate people differently and so it's important to ask the question of what would be meaningful to you um you know what do you want to get out of this experience ultimately what are what are you willing to do to kind of get to your next step and so it's important to have those conversations and i'm sure uh youth workers are are doing this on a on a daily basis but from the employer employment perspective that much more critical uh when we're talking about designing and making sure that there's access to um to opportunities for young people so that means that we have to challenge our traditional thinking about what meaningful work is or how it's been defined meaning a full-time permanent job with benefits where you either work monday to friday nine to five you have your evenings free you have your weekends free um that is that is just not very the case it hasn't been the case for a long time those jobs do exist they're part of the ecosystem of what's available but it, it is not the standard it is by far no longer the standard um and so we are starting to use terms like the gig economy um and and it's begging the question of should young people be steered towards or steered away from opportunities in the gig economy and so wanted to get your thoughts on that whether or not the gig economy creates barriers or actually creates opportunity for youth employment what do you think um i think it goes both ways and i say that because you can look at the gig economy in terms of precarious contract labor you have companies constantly hiring people for a period of three months without any health insurance without any job security and without any potential for the future after the contract is expired uh we could also look at gig economy in the terms of freelance work um and for people for example who are graphic designers you could say for example go around having one gig two gig three gig per week and that helps them go through sometimes the month depending on that person's skill level and remuneration um you know so in terms of the gig economy i believe that it should be looked at more from the perspective of how can you plan your own work day your own work schedule how can you narrate to your own gigs so to speak but being in control of what you have and don't have because the problem with the gig economy when it's being controlled by the employers and the organizations is that they decide what you have they decide when you stop work they decide whether or not you can have a job in six months and um i feel like that's a very unsafe way to live i feel like that's a very um um destructive way to look at work i feel like people should have job security and that's what we're fighting for the tyc we want to see that people have control of what they do with their skills and how they apply their labor in what way. Interesting. Okay. Any other thoughts, um, Tamara or Lucas? For sure, yeah. Um, so personally, um, the gig economy, I think it's awesome. 
I think youth in the gig economy, it makes these little young entrepreneurs and it's fantastic. And when you think of it, it's, it's existed for past decades and decades and decades. It's everything from uh, mowing your neighbor's lawn to shoveling the snow off your, your, your neighbor's driveway for five dollars. And it gives you the extra ten dollars um, to go out to the movies one night with your friends or whatever it may be to save up. Um, and for youth, that's all they want. So it depends what kind of gig and for what kind of youth. If we're talking about gigs, for example, that um, are just things that they're, they're, they're skilled at or things that they can do or, and, and things that they want to make some extra dough on the side, that's awesome. That's, 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 that's the love about it. And the best thing about it is that they can do it when they want. They're their own boss. They have no one to report to. So they can get a part-time job on the side and they can still do school. And that's what a lot of students are doing, especially in certain, in, in certain education fields. Um, for example, a lot of web developers now, they make uh, a website for whoever wants it. And they'll charge two, three, four, four thousand dollars for a website, and that's actually doing their pocket. And it's not a part-time job; it's not a full-time job. They'll work on it when they want to work on it. If they want to stay up late one night, they want to stay up late one night. That's awesome for them. Um, and with our technology out right now, there's a lot of marketplaces just for this gig economy. Five uh, RR, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Five RR.com. Anyone of any age, any youth, high school, college, university can sign on and say, "I will do this for X amount of money." So I can be a graphic designer for $10 a logo, or I can write you a, a title page for $5 a page, whatever it may be. So any youth of any trade set can go on that website and make money. And depending on, I guess, how good they are, how much time they can put into it, they can get cash out of it. And the, the thing that's awesome about this is that youth are then creating their own experience then to add on to the resume. Say if they create 100 logos, if you create 100 logos, you're going to get better at it. So then they can further explore their interests of education and employment, and they can, they can use that then to, to seek for future jobs or future employment opportunities in, in the future. Awesome, awesome. Mata, any, um, you have to give us three pointers. We, we kind of, we, you have oh, to man, pull that. I, I, was thinking, I mean, I think, is it barriers or opportunities? Just like Lucas and Aceve said, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to embrace it. We know that almost half of entry level jobs last year we're part time. So gig is the reality and 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 it isn't about your, the, the typical work week day that you described that as. So I think what that means is and what that may mean for youth is to really hone the ability to be flexible, to be agile. This is not easy. And for some, it may come more naturally and others may really have to work at it. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the, the new nature of work that we're in, which may mean that we need a different skill set mm -hmm. to be able to operate in it and to really um, be the best we can be and, and participate as fully as, as, as youth want to. I just want to do a quick uh, time check with Katie on how we're doing for time. Really well. I'm happy to keep the conversation going. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. 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 Okay. Um, somebody else had a, had a thought there. All right. Great. I was just going to add to Tamar's point and say that I believe that it is very important for youth in the current economy to be able to develop a you know multifaceted skill sets and be able to be a programmer on Monday and be an artist on Tuesday and be a chef on Wednesday because you know these things are very easily available for us and I might I say with caution easily available to select people which is a big issue as well right training mm -hmm. technology and things where you can learn how to do something in eight hours because you have quick Wi-Fi and a computer now some people don't have this some people do and I think that the issue is first of all making sure that people do make sure they take use of these chances and people who don't how can we bring these opportunities to them because if we, if we have websites and we have platforms that can teach you skills skills that people have to go to school for four years to learn in a condensed period of time you become certified at this and you have to be able to practice day and night to become you know competitively skilled at this this can really help us in the job market so I believe that yes, just being able to apply yourself in so many different ways that you no longer have to have a structured life and a structured salary and a structured work schedule and you can take a vacation in the middle of the year when no one has to approve your schedule is something that we need to start working towards. So let's talk a little bit about the people who spend most of their day working with these young people we're talking about, if not their whole entire day. 
Uh, we know that, so jobs are no longer standard nine to five. They come in all shapes, sizes, durations, conditions. <laughs> Um, different elements uh, or benefits motivate people differently, motivate young people differently. So the way I think you ended on a great point around, you know, you could be an artist today, a bookkeeper tomorrow or whatever, you know, every day. Uh, and so in my mind, that means me as a youth worker, I also need to be a bunch of different things for the same person over a period of time. And so want to get your thoughts on what is it that some practical elements um, or core core skill sets, core competencies, um, I'm trying to find the right word to put it, but what does a youth worker of today that's supporting young people to access employment and transition into employment, what do they need? How do they equip themselves? And anybody can throw into that one. I'm going to actually I can jump in with an offer <laughs> because it is really hard, right? How do you keep your skill set fresh? And uh, and I think we are um, we have access to a lot of information, right? Mm -hmm. Online more than we've ever had. And still, it's hard to know what skills are in demand, what um, youth might be well suited for that so so it's still a, an an interesting conundrum we're in mm -hmm. civic action has been working with uh, linkedin for a few years to try to make those connections stronger mm -hmm. and one of the things that we this year um uh, decided to offer and, and see the difference that it might make for those working closely with youth is giving access to linkedin learning linkedin learning is uh, an online platform that provides access to more than 12,000 courses. And that's great, so you can take up to 12,000 courses. What we've been doing with LinkedIn is actually curating a curriculum or a course list that develops the skill set that local employers are looking for. So it's intended to address the opportunities, the vacancies, that are in our own backyard. So um, the offer to the group that's uh, that that's watching this webinar is that we actually do have uh, uh, quite a number of licenses that we might be able to offer you. So if you are in a youth serving role, uh, if you are doing job developing, um, Katie, maybe you can uh, include my uh, email address. Please let us know, and uh, and we can give you access to courses that will help you develop the skill set and potentially offer um, uh, some of those learnings to the uh, clients that you serve. Oh, that's awesome. That That's very generous. That is awesome. And very important, how do you keep your finger on the pulse of uh, skill sets uh, that you need as you're helping others uh, right. through a process that's constantly evolving? Um, Lucas, any thoughts from, from your perspective on mm. how youth workers can better equip themselves to support this mm. work? Mm. Um, I'm not really educated as far as that fact, but I, I can try and give my, I guess, best head sense. Um, so what I can see as far as how youth workers can uh, uh, better off themselves or more, or look more, more, more attractive to youth clients is um, really, so there's two kind of clients that, that I see with youth workers. And one's the, two, the one's youth client who goes, and goes to the youth worker out of their own time and says, I need this. And the youth worker knows exactly what to do and then they help them out. And that's awesome because then they're coming to you. So the client will come to you and you can help them out. But then there's also the whole bunch of youth who may not know that that, that youth worker exists. So they may not know to go there or they don't have the opportunity to get there or they don't want to go there or whatever it is. So there's a, so from, I guess what my recommendation is for youth workers and for service providers or whatever, whatever it may be is to give an attraction to the youth of why it comes to see you, how you can help that youth that they can do on their own. So what do you offer that that's better from them, from them? just making a simple Google search and getting whatever information they, they can off that. So how do you make that whole kind of trip and hour of their time, which uh, youth consider so important to them, um, beneficial to them? So what can you do to almost be like a magnet to the youth and attract them? That's really what I see would um, be the most kind of beneficial tip I can give. Anything other than that, um, I'm not really too educated in. 
Well, you're doing it. You're in it right now. You saw an issue and you figured out what can I do about this? And I'm sure as you went through the process, there were some things that you, you didn't know so much about. Um, and so how did you fill those gaps for yourself? Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because, well, I mean, everything, I, everything about, um, I mean, the youth employment uh, industry and, and, and just employment industry in general, um, we've learned from just really um, doing Google searches and setting up meetings with them and learning more. And the one uh, message that we got out of it is that youth have a lot, is that we have a lot of resources to us. And the big thing that, that and the other message that we got out of, uh, out of that is that youth don't know about these, these resources, is that there's a huge disconnect, um, like we were talking about earlier, between these resources and the youth knowledge. Um, if all the youth use these, these resources, um, the problems of youth unemployment from what I can see or what from I can estimate would be less than it is now. So the, the, the factor really, from my opinion, isn't really pro providing these resources, it's connecting these resources to youth. Awesome, awesome. So Sivway, over to you. Um, that, first of all, that is a great question. I've been, been thinking about my response for that question <laughs> since they started speaking about their responses. But um, what I was able to think about, and please permit my information here because I'm not trained in social work, but um, I believe that one way we can help the youth workers um, cope with the changing um, labor market is by looking at the relationship more from a mentor-mentee perspective. I think that if the role of youth workers was uh, more also mandated on people who were successful in a variety of desired industries, this could really help what we see as the benefit of youth work. Now, I would imagine that a typical youth worker has a very big passion to see people develop and to see youth develop, which is why they're in that industry. And I believe that if this is their passion, it is also something that I believe everyone in the city should share. I feel like everyone should have that accountability within themselves to want to better the next person and the next person after that, because youth are the present and the future. And so I believe that if, um, necessarily we could integrate the mentor mentee program with people who have seen success in industries that are really desired by a specific demographic or of youth then that would be something to help youth worker or the youth worker structure um, necessarily succeed because if we can say hey yeah sure i can help you out with this this and that but this person who is for example a basketball star that you want to be in five years can directly tell you what he did over the last five years to become where he is today. Now, obviously, we don't have as much access to these people who we would like to connect them to youth, but it's a start. If we could start and say, hey, you as a successful person from the city of Toronto have an obligation to help the next person be successful, just like you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And if we get that relationship going where there's more of like a, you know, monthly meeting with your mentor, bi-weekly meeting with your mentor, if we're that lucky, I think that can really help the youth worker carry out their task and necessarily, you know, relate with the person they're helping out better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really, really, really powerful stuff. Um, so not easy work and <laughs> not easy work. It's, uh, it's just really interesting how, how you know, both of you, both yourself and, and uh, uh, Lucas had mentioned, you know, these are areas that you're not well educated in. That is how this sector has evolved. Uh, through working with young people, I mean, there is there is absolutely a professionalism to this work, um, particularly to youth workforce development, but it's not something that you can go to school and get a degree for. You know, this sector has evolved out of learning as we go. Uh, yes, there are programs like the Career and Work Counselor Program. There's even a professional designation for career development. That is very different um, from youth employment and youth workforce development and supporting young people outside of an academic setting. You know, in your local community, in your local rec center, in your after school basketball program, at your local uh beaver tails you know summer student job recruitment job fair kind of thing right there's no degree for that and so i think forums like this are so important for us to be able to share and and to learn and to leverage tools and resources um and create this sort of community of of um of support of mentorship of education <clears throat> amongst ourselves so i just want to pick up on the on the point that um you made lucas about the variety of resources that are available 
and and how much we don't know. Um, so if if each of you could maybe mention one or two resources that you would recommend uh, the youth workers who are with us to to look into, to think about, um, you know, to kind of you know take advantage of. Uh, or maybe you think, you know what, you found out, maybe there's a lot of other people who don't know much about it. Tamara, Tamara mentioned what the work that Civic Action is doing with uh, with LinkedIn. Um, so I'll give it to, to each of you to maybe mention one or two resources that you would recommend uh, the youth workers look into uh, to support their efforts. Mm -hmm, for sure. I know one right off the bat. Um, depending on what location you are, so if you're in any location, Hamilton, Toronto, Oakville, London, wherever it is, um, and you're a youth service provider. So let's start off with high school students and how to target them. Um, the high school curriculum has the grade 10 careers course. And this grade 10 careers course is solely based within the within the region that 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 school is in. So if uh, that region is say for example in Hamilton, then they'll show students Hamilton resources. And every resource that that student learns, most of them, every student knows about them. So, but the but the resources that aren't learned are the same resources that have the, the, the disconnect between you. So every single resource is eligible and can be get and can get into that curriculum. And it's as easy as easy as easy as just reaching out to the school board and asking the school board, setting up a meeting and and discussing how you can help youth. And and, and depending on it, it, depending on if you are different or not, and if you solve the problems, then you get in, then you can get into the curriculum. And there's other ways such as so so the, the curriculum is one, and the, the other one is my recommendation with guidance counselors. Send free promotional materials to the guidance counselors. You can go on Vistaprint, order 500 flyers, send that whole box straight straight to the guidance counselor, and they can decorate their school like it's Christmas with your flyers <laughs> for employment, London employment, Hamilton, whatever it may be, to get that connection to the student. So every you, so your main goal is so that every student in that school knows who you are, what you do, and when they experience your problem that you're solving, you're the first person who you contact. So that's for high school students. U university students is different and, and, and college students too. And the reason why I say different is because their type of employment is different than the employment type that high school students are looking for. The employment type that 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 that, that uh, university uh, college students and university students are looking for, it's it it, it, it kind of varies. So it can be the same high school students or part time jobs, gig jobs, summer jobs, jobs that uh, that that require no prerequisite experience. And then it can vary to jobs that they want experience in. So when they're out of school, then they can work for the same employer or whatever it may be. So these are may uh, these these are harder to target and harder to mainly kind of adapt. But similar methods can be used. And the one thing is is just get into the school, contact that that university or college student union, give them your promotion materials, put up flyers around the school. Um, say for McMaster example, McMaster down here lets you if it's helpful to the student put up lawn signs on the campus or put up flyers in the school only if you match two criteria. And that, and that two criteria is you have a phone number on the flyer or lawn sign and you have an address. That's all you have to do. And then you can decorate the school like it's Christmas or Easter again. So take advantage of these resources. Um, it's old fashioned resources, but it works. And your goal is to connect to as many students as possible to get every student to know about you. Awesome. Well, Simba, what about you? Any thoughts, go-to resources? Well, uh, as a Toronto Youth Cabinet member, I would have to advocate for our organization, so to speak. Um, we, we work with the city, so in, 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 in reality, we have access to a plethora of resources at the city that are aimed at improving youth equity and strategies of just helping youth development. So I would say, first of all, we meet um, monthly, second Thursday of every month um, mm -hmm. at City Hall. Um, and I would advise any youth out here um, from the audience to people, your friends and people you know, to come out here and network with us and talk with us. Um, we have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of resources. We have guest speakers and we, we uh, more or less bring all the energies of the Toronto youth to the City Hall each month, second Thursday of the month. So um, I would say start there and um, depending on who you are and what your interests are and how you um, aim to develop, we can always help you personally. But I'll say start there and come out for one of our cabinet meetings. Okay, awesome, awesome. Tamara, what about uh, from Civic Action? You guys have a lot of resources. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> oh, there we go. I will mention a couple. 
Um, the theme of mentorship came up, right? And, and the role mm -hmm. of youth workers as mentors. Um, the reality is it's unlikely you can be, you know, a mentor to everyone or perhaps uh, offer as much mentoring uh, as, as they may need or, or you, you may want to offer. And so with that um, in mind, I wanted to highlight a program that the United Way uh, of Toronto runs across York and across Peel and in Toronto, and it's called Networks. And there are now more than 500 mentors, young professionals working in workplaces across the region who want to mentor young people trying to transition to work or thinking about what uh, education path to take or just want to connect with people that they may otherwise not connect with. So, so that would be one, because you can't be everyone to, ev uh, to everything to everyone. And, uh, and really, it's about making as many points of connection. I think at an age that, uh, that young people are thinking about what to do, thinking about their passions, thinking about their interests. So the more we can expose them to the variety, the better. Um, the other, I won't miss the opportunity for, for another plug for Hire Next, but if you're working with uh, employers, direct them to the roadmap and the assessment. Because it's one thing to get a young person through the recruitment process and get hired. It's another to make it stick. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are best practices that frankly have been uh, tested here in Canada. So this roadmap and the assessment are loaded with local Canadian examples that work. And, uh, and if we can encourage employers to adopt these uh, changes, edits to their hiring and HR processes, I think we'll see better outcomes for them and for you. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. That's excellent. Um, so I think those are really valuable resources. I would strongly encourage everyone who's on the line to, to look into all of these resources, regardless of where you're located, because there's always something to be learned. Um, and if you have the opportunity to extract extract a protocol or process from a different community and bring it to yours or learn about how that could be uh, that could benefit the work that you're doing why not you know you have a network that you can that you can tap into and just uh, and just go from there uh, so Katie I'm going to do another time check and see if at this point there are any additional questions from our participants one quick question that maybe um, you can answer. Someone asked about how you find the NEAT rate in your community. Where would you get that information? How would you access that? Okay. Uh, any thoughts, guys, from the research? Maybe, Osivaway, I'll throw that to you from the research that you've been doing. I'm sorry, the question was, where would you find the NEAT population? Yes, the rate of, of youth who might be identified as being NEAT. All right. So, so if you if you would go to the city of Toronto website, there like literally Statistics Canada has like a metric that you have for each. So you can literally search, and it tells you it it stratifies it by neighborhood and by um. For example, it'll tell you there's a tool we have online actually that um, I can give um, Kathy to share with the participants. But what, what, what the person developed was that it tells you the demographic in that area. It tells you what the average income is. It tells you um, the education um, level, the average education level of that rate is. And it just gives you an understanding of the social economical differences between the wards in Toronto. So I'll definitely give Kathy the, the link for you to be able to go on. But a member of the Toronto Youth Cabinet actually last year um, Lee Tong, she designed this um, interactive, um, I'd say, mini website on the Toronto U website, uh, City of Toronto website. So you could find them there definitely. And this is Statistics Canada information, right? This is the way so folks who live outside of Toronto would be able to access data that would be reflective of the rates in their in their local communities. So no, so the the actual um, thing that tells you the the, the, the divisor by neighborhood is based in Toronto alone. The Statistics Canada um, numbers gives you percentages and rates of unemployment and growth for the country. That is available on the city website. But as per literally telling you who lives where within Toronto divided by wards, that's what that that uh, roadmap can basically give you. And I'll also say, you know, YouthRex, um, through our youth program supports, we do 
um, often get uh, requests for data. So depending on where you may be working in Ontario, if there's information about different youth populations that may support you in your work, you can also um, submit a, a request through YouthRex's website if that if that supports you, whether um, it's around uh, employment or, or any other issues that, that young people in your community may be facing. I'll just add that. Um, any other thoughts on where some of the data can be obtained uh, from Lucas or Tomato? You guys uh, work with some different resources. Um, for from my knowledge, um, I don't know of any other resources. Uh, you you already named all of them that I uh, that I that my first answer was. Um, there probably are a few others. It's just a matter of I, I guess exploring, connecting with with the resources um, that are offered. Um, my recommendation would would be to approach City Hall wherever you are and and ask uh, and ask the, the representative from City Hall, depending on which department it is. It varies by city by city. But um, if you just go, we even walk into the front desk and and, and ask who who can I see about this issue, they'll be able to direct you. <clears throat> Um, I will throw one other, uh, one or two other resources that uh, participants might want to look into. One of them is the Youthful Cities Index, um, and it's a really interesting report that's generated um, by a group that is based in Toronto, but it looks at, um, it rates cities not only in Canada, but across the world against a set of parameters that are, that are, pre that are defined by youth uh, based on the elements that are important to them. Things related to transportation, uh, ease of access to transportation, uh, the jobs that are available, um, you know, the average age of individuals who live in that particular city, whether or not there are social networks that are open and accessible versus uh, restricted and uh, that need to be prescribed to. So I would encourage you to take a look uh, to take a look at that. The the definition of meat is a is by nature fluid and it's a very difficult number to capture at any one point in time because you an individual can come in and out of that status quite quickly and then never be captured. Um, and so, so as opposed to looking at where can I find a report on meat youth, you may need to look at a few different factors that speak to young people at different points in transition in a particular area. Um, so the ESDC information is helpful. Looking at the Youthful Cities Index is really helpful because it not only gives you an idea of a Canadian city, various Canadian cities, but it compares it uh, using the same factors to cities in other parts of the world using the same youth index. Um, so that might be something interesting to take a look at as well. Um, and then provincially, for those of you who are outside of urban centers, the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities has an open data website where all the reports related to their employment programs, youth and others, are uploaded onto the site. So you can take a look at that. It is interactive, um, not perfect, uh, but data is very rarely perfect when it's collected, um, but it gives you some, <clears throat> some idea of <clears throat> provincially what the numbers look like from region to region and city to city. Um, and, and so that, that data may be helpful as well. So I'd encourage people to take a look at those. Um, any other questions on that side, Katie? Someone did have a question around, um, you know, we've we've talked um, at various points in today's conversation around engaging with school boards, local school boards, and one of our participants actually is a trustee within the school board. And so for folks who may be joining us who are actually, you know, have a role or a responsibility um, or work within the school boards, how can they connect to others to sort of advance some of the, the strategies we talked about today? So, so somewhat of a, re a reverse reach out. So Lucas shared with us how we could better connect with them. Um, so maybe some pointers and as to how they could better connect with the sector. I'm sorry, I couldn't really hear the, the, the question. I, it, it cut out halfway through. Do you mind repeating it? Yeah, I think it's, um, Katie, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the question centers around uh, how could we encourage educators to better connect with uh, the youth service sector, youth employment sector, um, to make them aware of the variety of opportunities that are available? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a so with that question, it's, it's almost um it's it's it, it's on the same grounds as kind of what what would um make a teacher kind of uh, wish to see their students uh become the best of their abilities or what makes a teacher just kind of do 
their job. So it kind of varies on, but it, it, it's within the same kind of context. So as far as um, with the school board and how can the school board help the youth, um, the one thing that, that we did, did our interviews within the city of Hamilton, and we asked, uh, I mean, we asked 30 youth, half of them in high school, so 15 youth from, uh, from both uh, school boards here in Hamilton, from, and two from each, each every school. Um, and, and, and we asked them, um, how do you feel the grade 10 curriculum course uh, taught you and prepared you for school? And most of the responses were good. Um, some responses uh, had, had some kind of, had some uh, disconnection between uh, they were still unsure about what their first steps were, or they were still unsure about, about more important topics, such as they want to know how to invest, or they want to know how to do other, other life activities. So as far as my answer, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not educated in this field, but my recommendation would be to mainly just um, get the data. So feel how, so it's as simple as sending out a survey to your students if you're at a school, or if you're a school board, sending out a survey uh, to a certain class, and re receive data. And with that data, find out what you want to know. Um, uh, as far as what I would know, I, I just be guessing. So find out anything that I guess you would want to know through a survey of how you can better prepare the youth in your school. Okay. Any other thoughts from the panel on that one? Um, so at the Toronto Youth Cabinet, we actually have an education working group so we work within working groups within the cabinet. I, I'm the leader of the equity and employment working group, but we have a lead, her name is Anne, and she's actually in high school, and she's the lead of the education working group. So um, like I said, we work every month at the CYC. So if the participant who asked the question would like to have access or come and speak to people who are in that sector uh, um, in education, uh, I highly encourage them to come and speak with Anne at the, at the working group. Um, every second Thursday of the month at the city hall. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, okay. <clears throat> I, I have a few points, yeah, I have a few points on that. Um, so I think the, the, the role of guidance counselors, teachers, the school boards, um, enormous. And it comes back to my earlier point around a lot of young people are at school and look to these uh, leaders in their lives for information about the jobs market at a time where it's really hard to know what's happening in real time. So to your point, Gladys, the data may not be perfect and it may not be available. And I think the board is in, in, in a tough spot, but also in an exciting um, time to, to think about, one, how do you capture or right. access the information about the jobs market in as real a time as possible? Communicate that to the teachers and guidance counselors that are advising young people about uh, whether that's education or employment paths. Mm. And also, I think, um, help them see uh, the skill set that can be nurtured and developed in the school setting and, and, and the opportunity for youth to, to really hone that and then be able to offer that in, in the workplace. We know that um, for some, non-traditional learning uh, opportunities may make more sense coming out of, for example, secondary school, or non-traditional jobs may be available. We talked about the gig economy. Mm -hmm. So it's a very dynamic field. Uh, it's not easy. I'm not sort of, it's, it's, it's not something that is readily available or packaged at this time, but I think the boards are and schools are um, integral uh, places for youth to get this information. So um, working with partners that may be able to offer that, um, maybe uh, the way to do that. And, and, and certainly for the person who asked the question, would love to go offline and, and have a chat with you about how that can be done. Yeah, I would certainly echo the comments that you all made and, and just add um, that I would encourage educators to see community service providers as partners um, uh, so that you can better leverage each other's resources. I, I, you know, we talked about the difficulty of youth workers keeping their finger on the pulse of how the labor market is changing, being able to access and interpret tons of information, tons of data in the way that makes sense for the person who is sitting right in front of you and needs support right then and there in that moment. Uh, how much more complicated for, for teachers with their classes, for guidance counselors. And so, and so consider you know, your local youth engagement uh, providers and employment service providers as a resource where there can be an exchange of information and a sharing of resources uh, so that 
you know, you take that pressure off of yourself, but you're also, uh, they also take their, that pressure off of themselves because that, that two-way street of communication is there. Not always easy, but certainly worthwhile uh, pursuing those types of relationships and um, expanding opportunities like Experience Ontario that uh, is designed to support young people leaving uh, the educational sector and un unlikely to pursue post-secondary education. So it's planning in partnership for those types of transitions. How do you start having that conversation while the individual is still in school um, as opposed to waiting till they get out and then now let's think about what am I gonna do? How do we start to pursue that? Um, so I would I would certainly stress you know see see community service providers as a, as an ally not a detractor and and um, and open up the lines of communication um, uh, you'd be, I think you'd be surprised at uh, what, what might come out of, of out of some of that communication uh, in addition to the elements the others mentioned as well um, so, yeah Katie go ahead I think we have time for sort of one last question. Um, and I'll put it to the group and then, and then folks can kind of chime in. I think it connects to a lot of what, what we've been talking about. But um, one question was, you know, how can youth workers um, really help youth who are facing multiple barriers get ahead of the game to find and maintain work when there is so much competition from other in potential employees who, who don't face the same barriers? That's a nice, easy one to end off with. <laughs> Anybody in particular would like to start? Um, I could go first. Sure. So I think the first thing to think about when we're speaking of these kinds of um, people that we want to help um, to get ahead of the game, so to speak, is more so to develop that personal relationship. First of all, and this is the primary thing, I think the youth worker and the youth being helped need to develop that personal relationship. They need to know each other and know what each other wants from the relationship and knows what, what the goals of each other are to make sure they're first on the same footing. And in terms of getting ahead of the game, I think it's important to establish personal relationships with employers. Um, I always say this to people I speak with um, and in facilitation events, employers are people like me and you. We both have the same 24 hours a day. We both like to watch TV shows. We both like to eat foods we like. We are all people that we can interact with outside of the regular apply online setting. I think the, re the importance of networking and information is that we have access to people outside of the regular organizational sector or organizational or regular eight to five workday. And I think that if you can have a personal relationship as a youth worker with employers that you know can, you can say, hey, I'm working with 10 to 15 group of students who are not in education or employment or training, but I know these 15 people can bring intrinsic value to your company. Now, if we can have a relationship where every five months you do a um, audit and say, okay, these people are exactly matching what I want for my company. Okay, but you've kept 10 of them. That's fine, that's a start. So I think, as opposed to the regular conventional, let's help these people in a group and let's try and help them. And, and I know and I know the numbers are very skewed because you don't have as many youth workers as you have youth. And that's one of the biggest problems. But I believe that trying our best as, like you said, this whole youth work issue is more of a learning curve. And so now I'm able to consider myself a youth worker or someone who helps the youth. And I'm saying if we can come together and say, let's develop personal relationships with employers with significant employing capability to say, okay, we have these youth always coming through the ranks. We want to make sure that they have as equal or as equitable a chance as people within their same age range. How can we get them in the game, but not necessarily stop other people who are equally as experienced to do so? And I think this is the best route. I think if we can have personal relationships and we can get people working with the connections we have, I think it's going to be a very, very significant game changer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Lucas, Tamara, anything you want to add to that? Would you mind just for repeating the question again? I'm going to leave that to Katie. The question was speaking to how youth workers specifically can support um, youth that face multiple barriers, especially considering those youth are you know, for lack of a better word, competing for um, job opportunities with youth who don't face similar barriers. Mm -hmm, for sure. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So in today's uh, world, no matter what it is, schoolwork, uh, job opportunities, competition, it's always competition, competition, competition. And for private sector employers, it's always um, who can do the job um, that I want well, and who, and, 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 and in some cases, who was the best at it. Now, for youth employment, a thing that we found when, with employers when we uh, were, were, were interviewing them, it's not necessarily they, they don't want a best employee they want an employee who will listen to them so there's a whole kind of um there's a whole miscommunication now where you think that they, they need to be the best 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 person to excel at that job and to get that job that's not the case uh with with, with, with youth employment that we found with youth employment um for, for, for high school employment at least it's that employers want youth who will listen to them and help learn with them. So who 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 uh, who will work when they need, need, need they need them to work. Who will do what they need them to say, as tedious as it may be, um, and that's what they want. So so as far as uh, for uh, for youth worker, uh, sorry for youth counselors um, who, are, who are helping with youth employment, um, employers who are looking for high school employees, they only want a youth who's reliable. They want someone who they can trust. That's it. That's their only criteria. If you're reliable, boom, you get the job. If you're the first to send your application in and you're reliable, they'll hire you right away because that's all they want. They're not collecting 10 applicants and they're waiting, all right, who's the best, who, who has a PhD. They want someone who they can trust, and that's their only criteria. It gets different from university and college positions, and depending on, on the experience required for that position, that's more what, when you get into a factor of competition. But as far as uh, as far as jobs where no experience is required, that's all it takes. It's you you need to be reliable and you need to be trustworthy. So as a youth worker helping a youth, this is the message that you have to convey. So you have you have to convey to the youth that when the employer wants you to work, you you need to work. If you need to outline right away before you're hired when you can work, and you need to stick by that, and you need to be reliable, you need to be trustworthy, and you need to somehow show that on your resume or show that in your interview, give them examples or give them scenarios where you're responsible, where you, where, where you were trustworthy, where you were rival. And these are not hard skills to have. All of us have these skills in one way or another. So it's a matter of how you can convey that to that employer. Okay, okay. Tomato thoughts? Um, great uh, points already. Um, I'd add that, I mean, I think that um, those supporting youth to transition to work one important i guess skill is to uh, and and to encourage youth is to to, to develop open lines of communication so just as lucas had said i think uh, it's absolutely true that employers for entry level jobs are looking for liability reliability and and trustworthiness and 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 key values and and skills that have been mentioned but reality is life happens and your availability may change, or you might not be able to turn up for work one day. And so early days, it's really important. And we say this to employers, the manager working closely with youth um, needs to communicate that it's okay that things may need to change. Yeah. And, or I am someone to come to, to have that conversation. It may not always be possible to adjust, um, but I think what's critical is to ensure and, and, and to let, um, youth who, who may not have that experience yet know that communication is key and, and that it may be able to overcome some of the barriers that will come up or some of the roadblocks that will come up um, to allow them to fully participate. So I'd say that that would be a, a really important uh, key message. Mm -hmm. So I'll just I'll just add to maybe close this off um, and, and thank you for for all your contributions today in the, in the conversation. Um, but to this one in particular, I think that's such an important point, uh, Tamara, about life happens um, and creating space for life to happen. And so for me, I came into the sector as a job developer. I'm not gonna say how long ago, it was just the other day. And um, and I did not know what that was. I had never heard of that before, And uh, but someone, taught me and someone showed me how to do it. What I needed to show to him was that I was willing to learn. Um, and there were other people that I started with and life did happen with them. There were there were different things that took place um, that caused them to step out of work and step back in. But one of the biggest challenges that I had uh, as a job developer was my ability to speak to uh, this need for flexibility and working through the changes that happened with my clients, with the young people that I was supporting with employers. 
I didn't have that language. What I needed, what, what it was driving me was the pressure of achieving how many people do I need to get employed this month? What are my stats? Because that is my job. That's my income. And so when life happens to a client, that made it really, really difficult for me to meet my own deliverables. And it started to skew the types of jobs I was going after, the types of clients that I was personally more willing to help. And I really needed to take time to sort of self-evaluate. Why am I doing this work? <laughs> Who am I really helping anybody by quickly making these types of matches? Um, and I think that's a really real factor in when we ask the question of how to help young people get ahead of the game. We are in the game ourselves as individuals working in this sector and being driven by deliverables and contracts and agreements and funding. And so uh, I think I think that that element of, of self-reflection and self-assessment in the work that you're doing, uh, knowing that you're influencing young people is really important um, and recognizing how life happens for yourself as well as uh, the people that, that that you're supporting. So so no easy fix. By no means is this work um, easy. Um, and we kind of learn as we go along. But uh, I certainly encourage everyone to continue to to do what they're doing and to do it well and to the best of their ability and, and take advantage of being able to connect with others who are doing the same work um, or doing and doing it differently. So Katie, I think we're we're all done. We'll throw it back over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to take a quick moment, first of all, to thank our panelists, to thank um, Gladys for facilitating this conversation. We really appreciate your time, um, your expertise, um, the ways in which you were able to share uh, practical strategies with folks. Thank you all so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us today for today's conversation. Uh, we will be um, sharing a recording of the webinar, um, asking our panelists to share resources so that we can provide those to you as well. Um, uh, feel free to get in touch with YouthRex at any time if there's any further conversation or connections that want to be made. And I just want to quickly remind everyone about um, YouthRex's Knowledge to Action Exchange that is happening in October um, here at York University. We are opening registration on Monday, September 24th. So we just wanted to flag that for folks who may be able to come to Toronto to join us to have conversations like the one we had today about issues that really impact youth well-being in Ontario. So thank you all for joining us. Um, feel free to visit our uh, exchange for youth work where you'll find our library and all of our archived webinars. You can also find us at youthrex.com. You can follow us on social media at Rex for Youth to continue the conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you again to uh, Gladys, to Tamara, to Sivue, and to Lucas for, for sharing with us today. Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone.